you guys out of, out of familiar passages. Um, and the reason is I like to go back as a believer in Christ and hash out what is the Bible saying. And many times it's funny how as we mature or as we get new lenses of life, how scripture comes alive differently to us. And so I'm, I want to talk to you guys about Peter's denial and about Judas selling Jesus for 30 shackles of silver or whatever the, the amount was. Um, and, and, and we've all know it, right? We've all heard it. It's, it's getting around that Easter time. And so we're like, okay. And I just want to talk to you guys about what, when our eyes met. So we all have those stories about, oh, when Sam met Valerie and our eyes met, when David met Tony, when Joseph met Skylar, our eyes met. It's, we have those stories, but that's not really what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, you know, it's funny, as we read into these stories, we see Peter, and he's getting ready to deny Jesus, and, and their eyes meet. And it's, it's a crazy thing. And, and Judas coming up upon Jesus, looking him in the eyes, getting ready to betray him with a kiss. And their eyes had to meet. And yet somehow these two had very similar opportunities, had similar growing up in Christ as they both came to Christ about the same time, followed him for about three years. And then they're faced in these moments. So what's going to be your outcome when your eyes met Jesus what was your outcome? You know, so many times it's, it, we had an experience with Christ. And in those experiences, we all need an experience with Christ. Amen. But we can have an experience with Christ and it not do nothing for our lives. Now, some people would be like, wait, well, what do you mean? It's very simple. Judas had many experiences with Christ and yet he hung himself. The rich young ruler, he came up to Christ. What happened? He walked away ashamed. I can have an experience with Christ, but if it doesn't change anything in my life, if I don't make those choices following my experience, it meant nothing. And so we can come into this church time after time, and I always say it, I can have an altar experience that never alters my life. And if I have an altar experience that never, never changes my life, it, it didn't mean nothing. That's just the reality. It was just another feel-good moment. I got some Holy Ghost bumps. And then I walked out of church and nothing happened. And so I want to just kind of talk to you guys. Because as I read this scripture again, I thought, I missed some things. <laughs> That's just the reality. So I'm going to start in Luke 22, 54 through 62. It says, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest. Now, this, they've already arrested him. They've already, Judas has already betrayed him. So having arrested him, they brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now, I've heard a couple different sermons preached about, oh, we shouldn't follow Jesus at a distance, and, you know, we got to be close. Listen, at this time, Peter is the closest disciple to Christ. He's one of the only ones actually still there. So I don't, I don't really agree with that. I, I think Peter is in a place that's very, very close to Christ. And so he's following closely, but far enough away, which I'm going I'm to get to in a, in a second because I don't understand. It says, now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, so Peter and at, most scholars believe that John is sitting with Peter. And so... It says, Peter is in the midst of the courtyard, sat down together. Peter sat among them, and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. Now, as I read this, something jumped out at me. I'm reading it, and I'm like, okay, God, what do you want me to hear? Here's what I don't get. Why did Peter deny Christ? That's what I thought at first, right? Okay, so fear was my, my first inclination because, oh, he doesn't want to die. But here's the truth. Peter is not scared because they already came. They had clubs. They had swords. They had everything. If they wanted to arrest Peter, they would have already done it. He, he done already cut off Malchus's ear. I mean, if they needed a reason to arrest Peter, they have it. He done assaulted the high priest servant. He cut his ear off. So 
what is Peter denying Christ for? I, I don't have the answer tonight. It's just an interesting thought for me because I'm sitting there looking. I'm thinking, originally I thought, well, Peter was worried about getting crucified himself. But, but yeah. It, right. It, it wasn't dying. It wasn't, it wasn't of arrest. So is it a moment when Peter's really literally, literally saying, I, I'm backsliding? And, and I don't know. It, that's why it, I, I started reading this, and I'm thinking to myself, now that's interesting. If they already came with the clubs, and they already came with the swords, if they really wanted Peter arrested, they would have already done it. So he said, you're with him. So here's the other thought. Why is it that so many men of God are so scared of little women? <laughs> Elijah goes running off of Mount Carmel, done killed 400 men of Baal, they all had weapons. They're all cutting themselves, and, and they stand there, apparently, and let Elijah kill them. And Jezebel comes along, and they're like, oh, I got to go. <laughs> what in the world is going on? Women, you guys have more power and influence than you realize, I promise. Listen, the Bible shows us time and time again, we fear you, apparently, because... Here Peter is, a little girl. It says a little servant girl. That's what cracks me up. It's a little servant girl. It says, you're with him. No, I'm not. Uh-uh, not me. So he says, and after a little while, another saw him and said, you also were with them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. And after a little while more, about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him. For he's a Galilean. Now they're breaking it down to, you know, you're not a, you're not a Jew. You're not with us. you got to be with him because you're a Galilean. So now they're breaking it into race. It says, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So he was obviously close enough that Jesus somehow was in the same courtyard because they believe that in Pontius Pilate's little deal, there's an outer court, an inner courtyard. Peter somehow gets an invite into the inner courtyard. He's sitting there with John. He denies Christ. Christ is sitting there, already been beat up, beard ripped out, and he looks at Peter. And so at this time, Peter looks up and he realizes now it says, what does it say? It says, how he said, it says, then Peter remembered the words of the Lord. This is important right here. This is so important for us to remember. In our moment of weakness, we must remember the words of the Lord. Because after that, it says, before the rooster crows, he says, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Uh, when I look at this story, it blows my mind because I'm sitting here, like I said, so many things begin to jump out at me. So many things begin to just cross my mind about thought, about seeing, about all these thoughts. So I just want to break some stuff down to you. Peter's life was one that from this moment on, from this very moment on, he would go to lead the disciples. Him and James, the brother of John, the, the Depends on how you look at it, brother of Jesus. Some believe that, that James was the leader of the church, depending on how you describe scriptures. Some believe that, it, obviously, the Catholics believe that Peter began to be the, the leader of the church. Either way, he was a very outspoken part of what was happening at that time. So I'm going to look down at, at Luke 22, 47 through 53. And it says, while he was still speaking, now we're going back to Judas's life. While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. This is important. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? So I want you to see something. According to the New King, Jean, New King James Version, he never got that kiss. <laughs> According to the New King James Version, he never got that kiss. He's, he went in for the kiss, and Jesus said, whoa, are you literally about to try to kiss me? Are you, and what he's saying is, are you going to try to flatter me with your lips like so many of us today do before you betray me? And he said, no, no, no. It says, 
But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you about to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When they arose, uh, when, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Now, <laughs> I read this and I started laughing for two reasons. So Jesus is over here and he's been praying for hours. He asked the disciples, hey guys, can you not tarry with me one hour? So can you not even pray with me for an hour? And they're all asleep. They're asleep. This reminds me of the little country church right here. Because look, they in a prayer meeting, all of them sleep. A fight about to happen, and now all of them are awake and got some swords ready. Do you want us to hit them? I started laughing because I said, if that ain't the little country church, I don't know who is. I mean, I, I sort of, the disciples reminded me of our church right then and there. They've been asleep for hours, Jesus praying to the point that sweat and blood is running out of his face. And the disciples all of a sudden decide, oh, wait. There's some people coming. Let's get up. <laughs> it says, we brought swords. I love that. In the, in the uh, New Living Translation, it said, Jesus, we brought swords. Do you want us to strike? <laughs> That's just funny to me. I've been asleep for four hours, but I'm ready now. <laughs> Sorry, Jesus, about the last four hours, but we're good now. It said, and before Jesus could say anything, here comes Peter. It says, one of them struck the servants of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit even this. And then he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, captain of the temple, and the elders who came to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour, and the power of darkness reigns guys I, I look at this and i think man there's so much there's so much happening in this so he looks at him and he says look disciples y'all kick back i got this uh, one one version says that when he spoke the first time he spoke all of them fell down and so it's like <laughs> not only do they realize at this moment okay this guy is serious because if you speak to me legit speak to me and all of a sudden i'm standing back there the back of the church and I fall over for no reason I'm like <laughs> uh, wait up what's going on here right and so so these guys had to be seeing this stuff guys their eyes are fixed on Jesus all of them at this moment are having an experience with God whether it's their first experience whether it's obviously one of their last experiences with him uh Every soldier in that place at that time had an experience with God. What happened? They still took him to be crucified. Pontius Pilate said, look, dude, I, I, I'm to the place. I wash my hands of this. I'm not even going to be a part of this. Y'all do what you want. And so they go to crucify him. But I wanted to, just to talk about Peter's life versus Judas's life. And he says, I'm going to talk about this. Conviction. It says a, a firm held belief or opinion. So when I look at, at conviction, conviction is a good thing. See, we, we think, I mean, you know, in the church sometimes that's kind of a bad, oh, I was convicted. But, you know, because we think of judicial terms. We think of judgmental terms. But the truth is conviction should never be judgmental. Rather, it should always lead to repentance. When I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit and I get that, I shouldn't have done that, then I have a choice. In that very moment, now I have a choice. And what I do from there determines what's going to happen next. Conviction leads to repentance, but if I don't repent, then it leads to condemnation. If I'm not careful, I turn into Judas real quick by a simple choice I make. Because if I do not repent after that, then all of a sudden, what happens? Now I'm going to be beating myself up. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I knew I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. And then what happens? Now condemnation's kicking in. Instead of me running to Christ and saying, Lord, I'm going back to the high place. Instead, 
I'm staying in condemnation. So Acts 2.37 says this. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples. Here's my man Peter again. This is a few months down the road. After they've been in the upper room, it says that Peter comes down. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He begins to preach to the crowd, about 3,500 of them. And it says, this is what killed, This is what's crazy to me. As he looks, he begins to preach to them. And it says, and they were struck to the heart, pierced to the heart. What happened? Conviction hit them, right? And then they realized, this is what's important after that. It says, so they said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, what shall we do? That's important. When it comes to repentance, we know the way. It's the blood of Christ. That's it. It's like Pastor always says. It's the blood plus nothing. Look, if I want to repent, I simply go back to the high place. I go back to the king, and I say, look, Daddy, I missed it. Please forgive me. Now, here's the thing. True repentance is not going to Daddy and saying, Lord, please forgive me. And then I come off of the pulpit, and I go back and do the same thing. That's not true repentance. True repentance means I'm going to turn my back away from that, and I'm going to continue in the high place. That's repentance, and we have to remember that. So it's an option. Second Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless. Toward him you have done foolishly in the sight of the Lord, so now you have wars. So that last part, he's talking to the children of Israel. But that first part is still adequate for us today because he's literally saying, for the eyes of the Lord run through the earth to and fro to give strong support to the heart of whose is blameless. How do we get blameless? We repent. It's simple. If I want to be blameless in the sight of the Lord, I simply go to him. The blood of Jesus is applied to my life. Now I'm blameless. I'm a spotless lamb again. But if I live in condemnation, now I'm staying in that. Now I'm allowing the, the conviction of the, Satan. As, and I'm going to come into this right here. It says condemnation is blame. It's the act of blame, being condemned. Condemnation always leads to torment. Always leads to torment. Always leads to fear. Always leads to the thing that's the opposite of faith. Right? And so if it's leading us to the opposite of faith, when we talk about our eyes, so in Revelation 12, 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accusers of our brethren and sistren who accuse them before our God, listen to this, day and night. Satan ain't at your house. Why? Because he's in heaven too busy trying to blame you for something. He ain't at your house, okay? So he's not in the Middle East. He's, not in, he's in heaven, and he's trying to blame you for something. But Jesus is standing on the other side of God just saying, Hey, God, remember what I did at Calvary? And God's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. What were you saying again, Satan? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, blood of Christ. Yeah, yeah. What were you saying again? Blood of Christ. Okay, yeah. What were you saying again? It's repetitive. Because there's never nothing that Satan can say that God is going to judge you for when the blood is applied. Never. There, you can't do enough sin that the blood isn't big enough for. It'll never happen. And so Matthew 5, 16, it says, the world is watching. Listen to this. This is so big. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. The world is watching. What was happening? Peter, he sat there and he's helped out Jesus. He's walked with them for three years. He's learned from them. He's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's been all these things. And yet, when the world began to watch, they didn't see what was manifesting on the inside. Why? Because he hadn't caught the revelation of who he really was yet. Until he had to repent and really get down to, okay, my king is gone. Now I'm going to have to walk this thing out myself. That's where we all sit today. Jesus isn't walking next to us, teaching us. He left us this. That's what we got. That's all we got. 
And so because we got that, this is what we lean on. This and the Holy Spirit guiding us and us listening. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, our eyes. This is a huge thing. Condemnation will always lead to fear, to torment, to bringing us away from the very thing that Jesus called us to, which is life and life more abundant. Okay? But our eyes, if we're not careful, they will always deceive us. Always, always, always. Why? Because we are very short-sighted as believers. We don't mean to be. We just are not like God. We can't see into the future always, right? We, we do our best to be prayerful in it. And we're saying, okay, Holy Spirit, what should I be preparing for for tomorrow? And he's saying, and he's talking to us. Sometimes the answer is no. Me and, me and Richard were uh, listening to the radio today, and uh, Garth Brooks came on and said, I thank God for unanswered prayers. And I said, Richard, I said, dude, I'm telling you, that's one of the most biblically accurate songs ever recorded. I'm telling you, because thank God. Uh, you know, why? Because we're nearsighted. If we really got every prayer we ever prayed for, dude, our lives would be so different. They would not look like they look, right? Because we think we know what's best, so we start praying according to what we see. And if we're not careful, that's the opposite of faith. Because he says, look, don't go by what you see, but go by what you see in faith. Because it's the very opposite of what you're going to relate to. Because... This world, believe it or not, is fading. It's not the real world. It's not forever. It's just a piece, just a, a lapse in time that Christ is outside of. And so we enjoy it. It's good. But the truth is, God's outside of time. He's not waiting on us to do anything. He, he gave us the tools. Now we go do it. Okay? It's our responsibility. But our eyes. So the girl looked at him intently. She's looking at Peter and she said, I know that you're one of those dudes. No, uh -uh, not me. You know what's funny is Peter is with another disciple at this time. That dude, he ain't saying nothing. He's like, <laughs> it's funny because it depends on which book you read. Depends on how how you see what the disciples are doing. So apparently at this time, like like the other disciples, like maybe he's on a pee break. I don't know. It's just, he 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 not there right now apparently because they didn't accuse this dude of being with Jesus. <laughs> Peter by himself, and so it's funny because Peter was always the outspoken one. So that's the one they remember. Hey, wait, you're that outspoken disciple of Christ. And so, sometimes it's not bad to be outspoken. But just know this. Nail that sticks out gets hammered. <laughs> just remember that. I know. <laughs> it's okay. Guys, Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And the train of his robe filled the temple. How did King Uzziah get to the place, or how did Isaiah get to the place on earth that he literally got a revelation of what the throne room looked like. Simple. The eyes gave up when his king died. Because the thing that was Lord of his life, he served Christ. He was a prophet. But there was a king bigger than God in his life. And his name was Uzziah. And when that king died, now all of a sudden, King of kings and Lord of lords came alive. And he thought, oh, I've been missing it. I looked at Uzziah because Uzziah was a man. I mean, this guy, is, he's, he's been given credit for all kinds of inventions, all kinds of strategies. And so it was very easy for them to look up to this man and say, oh, man. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing with Pastor Jerry because he's that big personality. He's, he's this big guy, and he loves the word, and he, he, he seems to be on top of everything. We have to be careful how we pick up the men in our lives because in the year that King Uzziah died, in the year that the king of his life died, all of a sudden now his eyes were open to the true king. We have to let some kings in our lives die. Then we're going to see God high and lifted up, and the train of his robe is going to fill the temple. The rich young ruler, again, with eyes. When I look at this, I think, man, what would happen today for a lot of us? 
if Jesus Christ knocked on our door, looked us in the eyeballs, straight up in the eyes, and said, young man, you follow all the commandments? Oh, yes, sir. Follow them all. Jesus starts listing them off, and he's like, done them. Yep. Nailed them. I'm good. He was a man that was full of morality. I mean, he was literally living right before king. He was living in such a way that most of us would be like, yeah, hey, that's a Christian, right? And yet when it came down to it, he could look Jesus in the eyes, have an encounter with God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. This guy is healing everybody he sees. There's wheelchairs everywhere. There's blind people seeing, dead people are raising. This guy's seeing all this stuff. He's walking around with them. He's given the same opportunity as the 12 disciples. Jesus says to him, hey, sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. Come, follow me. He didn't give that debt to everybody. That wasn't like, hey, why don't you come follow me, homie? It was literally, there's, there's only like 13 people he even gave the invitation to. One of them, sadly enough, chose to deny it. One of them walked away and said, I can't sell everything I have. This is scary to me in America because I feel like a lot of American Christians and a lot of first world country believers, this right here would catch a lot of us. David, sell all your guns. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't hear you right. What's that? And if we're not careful, guys, we can make dumb stuff gods in our life. Dumb stuff. If it's just possessions, just possessions, money. He was looking at forever. He, his name would have been written in this word. You would, have, you would have knew his name. Instead, he's just the rich young ruler. Nobody knows his name. Nobody knows what happened to him because he couldn't sell his possessions. Guys, our eyes are so important. In order for us to avoid some of the pitfalls of life, we have to have sight in addition to the ordinary sense of perceiving. So, yes, we have a natural ability to see, and they're good. If I want to navigate these stairs right here, it's good that I have eyeballs because I could <laughs> fall and break my arm, you know. How many times a day? I mean, you know, I'm working out of the camp. If I didn't have eyes, then my job would be very, very difficult, right? So we use our natural senses. God gave them to us. Whatever, however good they are, whether I need glasses, whether I need contacts, whether I got good eyesight, whether I got bad eyes, they're still better than anybody that doesn't have any eyesight, right? So when I look at my senses, they're God-given. But what else is God-given? He gives us the ability to have vision. He gives us the ability to have what is sight in the supernatural, okay? And so I'm going to list off some of these. Again, none of these are possible without faith because faith is what gives us right away or gives us access into the supernatural. And these are just some Greek words for different types of sight. Uh, Chesa, which is simply to see in a vision. So again, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. This is the same kind of seeing. It was in a vision. He didn't physically see the Lord. It wasn't Elohim. It wasn't God before him. But it was literally, it was, it was a vision. It was like Peter on, on Joppa. He saw a, a thing descending. And he, Jesus said, kill and eat. He's like, I would never. Lucky you didn't say that to me. <laughs> Just say it. So words of Amos, which saw concerning Israel. Amos 1.1. 1, 1, it says, the revelation was made to the inward eye, to the inner eye, to the spirit eye. It says, uh, the word of Yahweh, which is in Micah, saw concerning Samaria, describing what he saw in a prophetic vision compared to Habakkuk 1. See Revelations 3. See Revelations 4. There are all kinds of seeing, and this word in the Greek is literally seeing in, 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 into a vision or in the Hebrew. Uh, Horoa, which is uh, to, to take heed. So this is one that we need so many times in our life. But again, 
by the Spirit of God. It says, Mark 1, It says, and he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but you go your way, which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So, see that you say nothing. It's kind of a weird way for us to say it, right? Because we're like, see that you just don't, we'd say just, hey, don't say nothing. Right? But he's sa- literally saying see because he's saying take heed. Watch out because if you say something, they're going to respond wrong. First thing he does, goes to the temple. Hey, guys, listen, hey, Pharisees, what y'all couldn't do for the last 35 years, Jesus did right out here, like right outside of the temple. And so take heed. Jesus is warning him, basically. Take heed. He gives us warning to know. Uh, eat on which is to know, to note with the mind. So again, so when it talks about Mary, it says that she pondered these things when she was talking about Jesus, when he told her, I'm about my father's business, right? Mary took them into her mind and she said, I'm pondering these things right now. This is, this is beyond my ability to really see. And so what am I doing? It's beyond my understanding, so I'm pondering them. I'm working them out. I'm taking them through the word, and I'm seeing if it's right. Uh, Mark 12, 34, it says, And now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not from the kingdom of God, but after that no one dared question him. And so he, he was talking to, to some Pharisees, and, and the Pharisees were like, Okay, he's got all the answers. Well, just shut up because he's making us look stupid right now. So, again, this is to know. Jesus knew things that were outside of, of the natural knowing. It's a supernatural knowing. Uh, number four, uh, Theo Rio. It's, I, I like this one. It's the Oreo, which is the easiest way to say it. Uh, I love Oreos, so that's what I'm going to stick it with. It says the Oreo, and it says to view. It says to have knowledge or experience of. Guys, this is the one I've been talking about all night. We have had in our lives. Otherwise, we would not be in this building tonight. We have had experiences with God. But if we don't let those experiences change our lenses, then all of a sudden, nothing happens. We walk out of here with the same perception, with the same thinking, with the same eyes that we had before we came in. Guys, Jesus is trying to literally do what he did for Paul. On the road to Damascus, Paul's walking through, and he looks up, and here's a bright light to the point that uh, it blinds him. The, the scales came on his eyes. I don't know if they're fish scales, maybe snake scales, something, scales, whatever that is, to the point that Paul couldn't see. He had to be led around. He's walking around and getting led around by a little servant, and, and, and they lead him over there to, to the house. And then after three days... The scales fall off. Guys, that's what I'm talking about tonight. To experience God in such a way that the scales of our lives, the bad experiences, the experiences that take us away from true theology, if we're not careful, we have experiences in church, we have experiences in life that are not true theology. Okay? If it's not in the Word, be careful. Be careful. Because if we're not careful, what happens is my son, he, you know, maybe struggles with something. Well, now all of a sudden, well, now I got to be sympathetic to that, right? Well, he's just struggling right now, right? Isn't that funny? How all of a sudden, because of a loved one, because of relationship, now all of a sudden where I had a firm stance against something or I had a firm stance for something, but because somebody I love, had a different experience, then all of a sudden my stance begins to shift. Now, my stance is the Word of God. Irregardless. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying that's biblical. That's truth. And if I'm not careful, I can skew my truth. I can skew what I believe. And so, guys, I'm telling you, there is no king like our king. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And guys, if we don't change our perception, Dick, you can come play some piano. If we don't really change our perception, if we don't change 
the way we view things, if we don't let this begin to change and cleanse, that's what the Bible says. It, it says that the Word of God cleanses us. What is it really doing? It's taking all those experiences that have taught me other than the Bible. And it's saying, no, no, no. Let's get that view right where it needs to be. Let's get those steps. Why? Because it says that, that he straightens our path. So what's he doing? So really, in, in life, what happens is my eyes start going over here. He's saying, why? Because my feet go where my eyes are, right? No matter how hard I try, if I want to walk a straight line, but I'm looking over here, I'm going to fade that way. And so we have to be careful where our eyes are because our eyes are always leading us. And if we're not careful, we use our physical eyes and we can be short-sighted. We're missing what God has for a full potential. And if we're not careful, then we only use our physical sight and then we're missing some of the best things that God has for us because we're not opening our eyes in faith, but instead we're saying, ah, this is good enough. We begin to short side ourselves. We begin to shortchange ourselves. And so, guys, I just want to talk to you guys about our eyes tonight because they are, are one of the most powerful gates in our life. Some of the best things come in through our eyes. Some of the worst things come in through our eyes. Some of the things we see, man, we will never shake. We'll never change. It will always be embedded into our mind. Go to bed. Watch what's happening in our eye gates. And allow your faith to lead your eyes to a place that we're looking at Christ and Christ alone. And if we can do that, I'm telling you, you will begin to experience a supernatural life like you've never had before. Because faith is the avenue or it's the gateway to get there. And so I pray faith over everybody. Lord, I thank you tonight. I'm extremely grateful for everybody in this house. I pray that they caught this, that, that their eyes would literally be enlightened and that the perception, the, the, the view of life, the, the experiences that were not of you would begin to fall off. And the only thing that would be left is the experiences with you those altering experiences, those experiences where we really came to Jesus and we said, Lord, change my life. Change my life. Because, Lord, we don't want to be sitting by a fire one day and say, you know Jesus? Nah, nah, I don't know that dude. But instead, I want to be able to stand up with a boldness and a fire in my eyes and say, man, that's the lover of my soul. That's the King of kings. That's the Lord of lords. If you want salvation, he's here for you. If you need deliverance, he's here for you. If you need healing, he's here for you. That's a long-haired Jew that I'm so in love with that I couldn't do anything except for to praise him. Lord, let us all to have an answer like that. But let us to be wise as we understand if we come off that that wild or that bold sometimes people will be a little turned off by that but lord let us just to be passionate in our pursuit of you but our eyes always have to be in front of us and to be in pursuit of something we have to see something and so lord let us to pursue you because we have our eyes on you i thank you for what you're doing in the little country church be with our pastor bless us in jesus name we pray amen and amen listen Miss Dana's girls have some Girl Scout cookies. She, she going to set up shop in the back. I told her, I said, I'll give you a little promo since I didn't sign up for them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little plug at the end of service. <laughs> if, you, if you guys need a little extra weight, she's going to have about 32 boxes of extra weight in the back. Uh, just, it's